Environmentalism is often painted as a liberal concern, with climate change more readily believed by those on the left of the political spectrum. But there is a school of thought that this doesn't have to be the case, and that the secret to changing minds lies in how ecological arguments are made. Joining us now for more, in Lubbock, Texas, via Skype, Catherine Hayhoe, atmospheric scientist and political scientist at Texas Tech University, and with us here in studio, Matthew Feinberg, Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. As I welcome both of you, Catherine pointed out before we started the kind of interesting anomaly we have here, which is Catherine's from Etobicoke, but on the line from Texas, and you're from Las Vegas and here in Toronto, so we've got the... Anyway, it's, um, <laughs> we're going to figure it all out as we go through this. Uh, Catherine, welcome back to the program. Matthew, nice to have you here for the first time. I want to start, actually, Catherine, I'm going to give you the first word, but I'm going to give it to you on tape, because some of your data you laid out in a recent TEDx talk, and we're going to play a little clip of that, and then we'll come back and chat. So let's roll the clip, please. So if we look here, this is the temperature of the Earth starting in 1900. And we see that one year may be colder than the other, one year might be warmer than the other. But over the century, as we progress through time, our planet is getting warmer and warmer. That's what we see in the data around the world. Okay, that's quite an animated graphic that really demonstrates the point that you tried to make. And I guess the first question here, Catherine, is who made that? Who made that chart? That chart comes from NASA. And because and it comes from NASA, does that mean that those who are either liberal or conservative, will find it legitimate? Well, interestingly, NASA is what convinced my husband. When we got married, you know, I was the naive Canadian. I had never met somebody who didn't think climate change is real. And he was coming from the South. He had never met somebody who did. <laughs> so we never thought to ask each other before we got married because we just assumed that clearly we were on the same page. <laughs> we weren't. And we spent quite a bit of time after we got married discussing this. But what convinced him was NASA. He said, either I have to believe that NASA, who put men on the moon, is involved in this global worldwide hoax, or I have to believe that NASA actually knows what they're talking about. So for a conservative, NASA was the good housekeeping seal of approval, and that was good enough. It was. And ironically, we actually had a bunch of articles in Good Housekeeping in April about climate change. So we got that seal of approval, too. <laughs> Very good. All right, Matthew, let me get you into this. And in doing so, I want to put up a chart of yours first. This is a paper entitled Morality and Environmental Attitudes that you and Rob Wilder uh, put together together. And w you note five fundamental domains of human morality. And let's just go through these. This will take a bit of time, but we'll take the time. Here we go. The five moral domains. Number one, harm or care. That suggests concerns about the caring for and the protection of other people. Number two, fairness and or reciprocity. Concerns about treating other people fairly and upholding justice. Number three, in-group loyalty. Concerns about group membership and loyalty. Number four, authority slash respect. Concerns about hierarchy, obedience, and duty. And five, Purity slash sanctity, concerns about preserving purity and sacredness, often characterized by a disgust reaction from the Feinberg and Willer paper of 2012. Now, these five domains, do they tend to break down in terms of, again, as we were just suggesting, liberal versus conservative thought? Absolutely. There's a, a bunch of research looking at uh, that very question. And uh, it's, done con uh, it's been conducted mostly by uh, Jonathan Haidt and his colleague Jesse Graham. And what they find using large samples, uh, extremely large samples of uh, tens of thousands of people, is that there is a division. That uh, the more left-leaning individuals, the more liberal you are, the more likely you are to endorse strongly the harm care and the fairness reciprocity uh, domains, more so than the conservatives. But if you're more conservative, you're more likely, relative to liberals at least, to endorse uh, the other three, the in-group loyalty, the authority respect, and the purity sanctity. And there's a, a a great application of this if you think about it in terms of, say, same-sex marriage uh, debate. Uh, so uh, on the left, the argument in favor of same-sex marriage is primarily grounded in fairness reciprocity concerns about equality, about not discriminating against somebody. But on the right, endorsement or uh, opposition to same-sex marriage is primarily grounded in purity concerns about uh, the, the fear that it's impure to engage in homosexual uh, behaviors and also that it's against uh, one's 
uh, biblical beliefs or religious beliefs. So Catherine, let's, uh, let's see where the rubber hits the road here. When you're actually giving a speech, like that TEDx talk that you just did, is it incumbent upon you, therefore, to know who's in that audience because you're going to, you're going to focus your arguments more on the moral domain that fits that audience as opposed to not? Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. And I think Matthew would agree there's this thing called segmentation where we know that certain messages appeal more strongly to certain people depending on who we are, what our values are, and what's important to us. So it's absolutely essential to understand what people already think about climate change, why they think that, and what could possibly move them before you open your mouth. Otherwise, it's going to be a complete mess. Following up with Matt then, do you think environmentalists have ended up, uh, maybe undermining is too strong, but let's say not helping the cause, of promoting climate change issues because they depend too heavily on this harm slash care argument rather than one of your other moral domains? It's a good question. It's a, it's, and it requires a tricky uh, you know, analysis. So if you're looking at the big picture, the environmental movement, of course, uh, succeeded a lot because of the arguments. But it was because the left and, to some extent, the moderates uh, were on board with it because of those arguments uh, and similar arguments like that are grounded in harm care and fairness and reciprocity. Uh, but now we're at a point where the majority, vast majority of uh, people on the left and, and also moderates are on board with the movement and now it's kind of stalled uh, because the right is not on board. So at that point I think, yeah, it's time to make a change in terms of the messaging, the rhetoric that goes into it so that everybody will be on board with the movement. Let me read something from a couple of months ago. This is from Lamar Smith, who is the chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. He's a Republican, actually, Catherine, from where you are right now in Texas. And he rebutted President Obama's Earth Day speech by first quoting from it. And here's what Lamar Smith had to say. Today, our planet faces new challenges, but none pose a greater threat to future generations than climate change, President Obama wrote in his proclamation for Earth Day. Given that for the past decade and a half, global temperature increases have been negligible and that the worsening storm scenario has been widely debunked, the pronouncements from the Obama administration sound more like scare tactics than fact-based declarations. The intellectual dishonesty of senior administration officials who are unwilling to admit when they are wrong is astounding. When assessing climate change, we should focus on good science, not politically correct science. Okay, Catherine, back at you. Who's got their science right here, the administration or the congressman? Well, the administration's science doesn't just come from their own opinions. It comes from the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which is this massive document written by hundreds of scientists, peer-reviewed by thousands more, and which I helped author both this time as well as the previous version, too. So the administration has their science right. But here's the thing. People often... Uh, pose or frame their objection to climate change in terms of the science. They have these talking points like, oh, you know, it hasn't changed. It's not as bad. It's been debunked by a paper that was, someone was paid to produce for the coal industry, just like with the tobacco industry back in the day. But with Lamar Smith, with many others, the real objection that they have is not to the science. They object to the solutions because climate change is a tragedy of the commons which by definition means that it requires collective action, like we're so good at in Canada. But in the US, collective action means government policy. And for many people, that is anathema. The opposition to collective action, government interference, and taxes, because of course, one of the biggest solutions is carbon taxes, that, that resistance goes back to the American Revolution. It is burned deep in the American psyche. And that is where the roots of climate denial lie. So, Catherine, why do you think this uh, Republican congressman is attacking the science then? It's a lot easier to say, oh, this isn't a real problem, than it is to say it is a real problem, but I don't want to do anything about it. <laughs> Matt, I hear this all the time, actually. When you, when you ask politicians in the United States, if they're Democrats, what do you think of climate change? They will say, yes, I believe in it. It's a real thing. We've got to do something about it. If you tend to ask Republicans, I've heard Marco Rubio say this. I've heard Chris Christie say this. They say, well, I'm not a scientist. So I really can't weigh in. Does that make sense to you? Well, we don't ask our politicians to be scientists. We ask them to be politicians and uh, employ the science that, uh, that actual scientists uh, develop and use that uh, to form policy. So no, it doesn't make sense. They both seem like they're speaking a different language, though, to their respective bases, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, that gets at the larger point that I think Lamar Smith was uh, tapping into, which is this idea that there are many people 
that are either opposed to science or skeptical of science or cynical of science. And uh, when you speak in terms of science to them, they become, uh, they get turned off. They, and any message that's science-based may actually backfire because uh, they see science as, a, as one way or another an attack on them. Uh, so uh, it's important to recognize that individuals that have that, um, that leaning, that they're, they're not necessarily in line with uh, uh, or in favor of scientific arguments are, are not going to be persuaded with those. And a good way to, to get, on board, get them on board with your uh, argument is to say, I'm not a scientist, or you know, science is not what we're talking about here. So the follow-up to Catherine would then be, what do you think about the fact that, that a politician who's actually the chair of a House committee on science, space and technology, seems not to like science? Well, when you look at polls about what people are most polarized in the United States on, so if you're a Republican or a Democrat, what issues are you most divided on? Climate change is now right up there at the top. But not too far from climate change is, do you trust scientists? Hmm. So somehow, you know, do you trust your accountant? Do you trust your physician? <laughs> you know, these things aren't on the list, but somehow science has become politically polarized. And that is the tragic situation we're in. And so that's why as a physical scientist myself, I studied physics and astronomy at U of T. That's why I've come to believe that social science, which is what Matthew does, is the most important science we can be doing right now to understand our attitudes and perceptions and actions on the issue of climate change. Do you think, Matthew, do you share Catherine's view that, that science has been politicized in a negative way because some people on the political spectrum just don't like the answers scientists are coming up with? I think that's absolutely the case. It's not just about climate change. It's about a variety of uh, mm -hmm. issues that, uh, that are, can be and are typically argued by the left in scientific uh, bases, uh, but may not coincide very well with uh, many people on the right's uh, perspective. So a lot of it is about motivated reasoning. Uh, if you hear an argument uh, that doesn't go along with what you already believe, chances are you're going to resist that argument and find holes in it. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's going on a lot. I think many of our viewers will be aware of the PBS series Nova, which has been around for, I think, a couple of decades now, doing uh, programs on various scientific topics. And Catherine, we're going to take a look at a clip that you did for a video for Nova. This is called The Secret Life of Scientists and Engineers. Okay, Sheldon, let's roll that clip, please. There's often a perceived conflict between science and faith. It's a little bit like coming out of the closet, admitting to people that you are a Christian and you are a scientist. My husband, he is the pastor of an evangelical church, and many people would approach him to ask him questions about climate change. If anything, there's even more questions in the Christian community because we are targeted by so much of the disinformation that's going on. First of all, I have to say, I love the way you dress up for TVO and you dress down for PBS. We like that. Thank you. <laughs> Second thing is, who do you see as targeting the Christian community with this information? Our thought leaders. And behind them, you know, for a long time, people thought it's the fossil fuel industry. And back in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was. But today, it's not really the fossil fuel industry that's spearheading this kind of climate science denial movement. It's all of the people who recognize that climate change requires collective action. It requires government policy. And so these messages are being fed to us through the conservative media. They're being fed to us through politicians. And in the more conservative Christian circles in the US, there's a huge leadership vacuum. You know, Catholics have the Pope. Um, the Anglicans have the Archbishop of Canterbury. Episcopals have their own bishop who says great things about climate change and environmental issues. But when you get into Baptists, Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, Evangelical Free Churches, there aren't those leaders in the church who are willing to stand up and say, this is what is true. So where do we go? We go to the media. We go to our politicians and our thought leaders. We go to people who share our values, and they're telling us this thing is a big hoax. Well, let me talk about a leader of a different kind. Actually, he kind of has his own church, Rush Limbaugh. He's got millions upon millions of adherents who worship at the Church of Rush every day mm -hmm. and says things during his sermons, such as, if you believe in God, then intellectually you cannot believe in man-made global warming. How challenging is it, therefore, for people like you to get your message out to conservatives uh, when you're competing with the likes of this? It's tough, and I'm, I'm going to be totally honest. If I could do one thing, if I had a magic wand or one wish, 
I would change what conservative media in the United States says about climate change. That's the one thing I would do. But given that I don't have that magic wish, <laughs> what I do when I talk to people is, you don't counter those types of arguments with science. You don't pull out you know, 3,000 pages of scientific reports from the latest IPCC report and smack them upside the head with it. What you do is you have to meet people where they're at. So in that case, with that very frequent argument that, oh, if God's in control, this couldn't happen, you know, you little humans are being so arrogant, assuming you could change something as big as the planet. We have to go to the Bible, which is actually not that hard to do, and just say, look, God made the planet. God gave it to us. God told us that actions have consequences. Here's this verse and this verse and this verse that say these things. And here's how our choices and our actions have created the consequences we're seeing today. And how, do you, how persuasive do you find that argument when you make it to conservative audiences? Extremely, if they're willing to listen. If they're willing to listen. So that's another challenge as well. Yes. Hmm. I only go where I'm invited. I don't push my way into places, you know, trying to <laughs> elbow people out of the way. But if people are willing to have me, I tell this to them. And, and you know, the responses I get, the worst case scenario is, uh, you know, I used to think climate change wasn't real, but you answered all my arguments. So now I have to make a decision. If I'm going to keep on thinking it isn't real, I have to have new arguments or else I have to change my mind. Hmm. If I can get people to that point, I feel like that's, that's the right place to be. Right on. Uh, Matt, again, going back to that chart with the five values that you had on it before, when Rush Limbaugh says the things that he says, what, what moral arguments is he trying to tap into in order to address his flock? He's saying if you believe in God, you can't believe in, uh, in climate change. That's definitely uh, within, the realm of, uh, with the, within the realm of purity, sanctity, for sure. The, the expression global warming, which is what everybody used to call it. Yes. They don't call it that anymore. Now it's climate change. How problematic was that in terms of trying to advance the, the debate? So there is actually some literature on this uh, suggesting that it was very problematic that you could ask the exact same question but just replace global warming with climate change or vice versa, and you'd get different responses. Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, quite problematic. And I think that uh, connects with the notion of the difference between weather and climate, uh, where if someone says it's global warming and it's cold outside and colder than usual outside, then it's hard for us sense. to understand. Uh, so along those lines. Gotcha. Uh, let's bring up, Sheldon, I think we got a couple of graphics here we want to bring up. And this is, yeah, here's your first one, Matt. You can look at the uh, monitor over my shoulder here. Does moral domain shape environmental attitude? We see that liberals respond much more strongly to the harm slash care message. Liberals being in the red, conservatives being in the blue. But conservatives have a significant upswing in their pro-environmental attitude when the message has a purity slash sanctity slant. So can you, I know you just did, but give us another example of an environmental message with a purity slash sanctity foundation, which therefore conservatives might be more open to. Sure. Well, I think what Catherine described was an excellent example of what she does fits perfectly with the research we did uh, in terms of describing it in term, uh, within the Bible and using verses. Uh, what we did in this study was actually the other side of that moral domain, which instead of looking so much at sanctity, looking more at the purity aspect. And what we argued was that uh, in, this, in this paragraph or two that people read, that it's disgusting that we'd have to inhale uh, contaminated particles in our air because of pollution. And it's disgusting that we'd have to drink water that's contaminated with who knows what that's entering our bodies and getting on our skin and becoming part of us. And if you highlight this, uh, this impurity, this disgust component, it really seems to have an impact on those who are more right-leaning and endorse that purity hmm. uh, foundation. Let, let's bring up that same graphic. Yeah, I misspoke. We don't have two graphs. We have the same graphic that I want to bring up a second time. Interesting, when, when conservatives respond much more favorably to the purity sanctity theme, that's the, the third one there on the right-hand side, liberals, as we can also see, they don't drop off very much when you make that argument. Why is that? Well, I think it, it's, they're presented with an argument that's in line with something they already believe, with, it, believe in, and which is climate change. And in that case, I think it was environmental attitudes more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's presented in a way that isn't necessarily appealing to them because it's uh, a purity argument, uh, so it's not something that really hits home with them, but it's not something that's opposed, uh, it's not annoying to them, it's not something that's going to create skepticism or cause them to go against their initial attitudes. It's just kind of a control condition in a sense. I'm making an argument that doesn't really appeal to you, but it's still an argument in favor of something I already am in favor of, so I'm probably not going to be persuaded, but not dissuaded either. Catherine, how well do you do when you try to make the purity slash sanctity argument to conservatives? Well, it's really interesting because the purity one is a tough one when it comes to climate change. 
So Matthew described how the purity can relate to seeing environmental degradation, witnessing it with our eyes, breathing in particles of air pollution, looking at deforestation or contamination or visible signs of environmental degradation. So that's where it's really easy to invoke the purity argument because people can see what's happening, that it's impure. The problem with climate change is it's because of these invisible particles. Carbon dioxide is invisible. We can't see it. We can't smell it. People say, oh my goodness, we have so much carbon dioxide in the air, but you look up and there's blue sky and white fluffy clouds. And people say, well, what are you talking about? Everything looks fine to me. So we have a huge challenge there in that the purity argument works really well with conservatives, but it's super hard to tie purity to climate change. Let me follow up with this. This is out of the New York Times from a, a recent argument, a recent article rather. And uh, I'll, ju I'll just read you an excerpt from it. White evangelical Christians are about 40% of Republican primary voters, representing a majority of the vote in many of the party's caucuses and in the Southern primaries. That gives an evangelical favorite an easy road to winning many contests. Again, following up, I'm trying to uh, get a, a greater understanding of how you marshal the arguments on your side to, to a conservative audience, which are hearing all these arguments now that there's I think on last count, uh, 247 people running for the Republican presidential nomination. <laughs> Not really, but it seems that way some days. Have you been attempting to convert any of the potential Republican presidential candidates to your view of climate change as a conservative evangelical value, making that argument? Well, it's really interesting that they use that word convert, because that's actually part of the problem. Climate change is being deliberately framed as an alternate religion. Hmm. And it doesn't help when we go around asking people, do you believe in climate change? And so if you look at that editorial by Lamar Smith that you referred to earlier, and you look at many statements that conservative media and politicians and thought leaders are making, they're equating climate change to the Church of Climatology, where Al Gore is the priest, and I am the high <laughs> priestess often, as some of my emails accuse me of being. So, so that is part of the problem, is it's being framed as an alternate belief, and over 80% of Americans already have a belief that they are very happy with. Thank you very much. So you can't get them to convert? No, converting is not the issue. Hmm. The issue is to, to understand what people already care about, what is already in their hearts, what is already important to them, and then connect the dots between what they already care about and the issue of climate change. That's what we have to do. We can't try to instill new values into people's hearts. If they're over the age of five, good luck. Hmm. Matt, there's a former Republican congressman by the name of Bob Inglis. He's become an outspoken advocate for carbon pricing. Republican for carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. He visited Antarctica. He studied British Columbia's carbon tax, which was designed to be revenue neutral. Is his environmentalism, in your view, indicative of a shift among conservative Christians? I think it's starting. I think he may be at the forefront of it, but uh, I think you have to also separate the politicians from the, the general population. And if you look at a recent uh, poll by John Krosnick at Stanford, it does suggest that there's been a shift that's uh, ongoing and it seems to be gaining speed, uh, which is that even uh, Republicans are now looking uh, to f have politicians lead them that are not climate change deniers. In fact, now for the first time, a majority of Republicans and of course a, a vast majority of independents and Democrats all are in favor of having somebody in, in the Oval Office that would prefer, uh, that, that is a climate change believer as opposed to a denier. So I think there is that movement. I actually think that um, the right in terms of politicians is behind the populace, but I think they're going to catch up very soon. Well, here's the flip side of the argument, and that is, Catherine, um, I, was it five years ago that Congressman Inglis uh, tried to run for re-election? And, uh, I mean, he never even made it to Election Day. I think he got primaried out within his own party. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and in, a, in a rather lopsided contest as well. Does that suggest that if you're a Republican, conservative Republican, um, environmentalism is now kind of a third rail of politics and you've got to avoid it, otherwise you're going to get zapped and killed? Not just environmentalism, but climate change in particular. Hmm. As I alluded to before, climate change has now become one of the top most politically polarized issues in the entire United States. But from my perspective, at least, I feel like we've hit rock bottom. You know, it can't really get any worse than that. And when we look at polls, including a recent poll from the Yale Climate Communications Program, they have this great map of the entire United States where they ask people questions and they break it down by county, by congressional district, and by state. And what they find is not only do the majority of people think that climate is changing due to human activities, 
But many people support solutions. They support investing in renewable energy. They support limiting carbon pollution. And just under half of the country, which I think is amazing, supports a price on carbon like BC does. So we see um, agreement not just on science, but on solutions, which is really the important thing. Because from my perspective, I often feel like, you know, it's OK if we don't agree on all of the science. But hey, if we can agree on the solutions, that's what's really important. Hmm. Matt, this is uh, potentially a confusing debate for Canadians because we don't necessarily see and being pro-environment and being conservative as at loggerheads. They are perfectly consistent. And, uh, you know, I just I recall a few years ago, I think um, Corporate Knights uh, gave out an award to the greenest prime minister. I can't remember if it was of the last half century or the last hundred years. And the winner was Brian Mulroney, a conservative. And one of the members of the jury was Elizabeth May, the Green Party of Canada leader today. Can you, say, but this, again, to, to an American audience, this may be impossible to believe. Can you cite examples where environmentalism and conservatism, conservative values, actually work well together? Sure. Well, historically, there was minimal polarization between the left and the right on, on environmentalism. If you go back to the days of Teddy Roosevelt uh, in the early 1900s, one of uh, a president of the United States at that time, uh, he started the national park system because he was a conservationist, or what we would call an environmentalist. Uh, and then fast forward about 50 years later, and who founds uh, the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, is Richard Nixon, Nixon is a, a, you know, clearly a, a Republican. Uh, so at, at that time, uh, leading up into the 60s, there was minimal, if any, uh, division between the left and the right when it came to the environment. It's only you know, the past 50 years, or really less than that, really when it came to climate change, that the, the division came about. Catherine, do you agree with that? Was it climate change that really set conservatives against the environment, if I can put it that way, or did something happen before that? It wasn't just climate change. It was the imminent threat of having to do something about climate change. Hmm. That was what set conservatives against it because, again, climate change being a tragedy of the commons in that individual action is always, by definition, insufficient to fix the problem, it requires government intervention. It requires a, a price on carbon, it requires removing fossil fuel subsidies, it requires ultimately phasing carbon out of our energy system. And that requires large scale action with some winners and some losers. And the losers are the ones who have all the money right now. So they're resisting as hard as they can. Right. Okay, one more time, let's take another look at a clip from the documentary you did for PBS, The Secret Life of Scientists video. Roll it, please. One of the first times that we went to church in Texas, I met a couple and we were introducing ourselves. They asked, what do you do? I explained that I studied global warming. And they said, oh, that's wonderful. We need somebody like you to tell our children the right things. You would not believe the lies that they're being taught at school. They told us that the ice in the Arctic is melting and it's threatening the polar bears. And I said, well, I'm afraid that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so if, if, fo follow up on that conversation. What happened next? I never saw them again. <laughs> 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 but that's kind of indicative of many conversations I've had. And so um, down here, every, you're very, very stereotyped based on what you think about climate change. It's almost become um, something required to belong to our communities, to our families, to our group of friends, to our church, to our political party. And so it really throws people for a loop when I don't really actually push all the same buttons, but I still think climate change hmm. is real. And I think that that kind of cognitive dissonance, so to speak, is what we need to set up in people to say, you know what? There is nothing inconsistent with being conservative and caring about the environment. What's more conservative than conserving our resources? Uh, let me do a quick follow-up with you, though, Catherine. Where, where are they coming? Where is their headspace when they assume that they're sending their children to a school where the teachers are all lying to them about some of the most fundamental things in in life? Distrust of government. Hmm. Distrust of government is rampant. Um, it's the United States is a very individualistic country, so people depend much more on themselves than on the government. And if you look at the history of the United States, even though you know we're side, Canada and the U.S. is side by side, the history is radically different. The history is one of overthrowing government, rejecting government, distrusting government. And so when government is spearheading the effort to say this is a real problem and it requires government action and government collecting more of our money to do who knows what with it, hmm. that sets off all kinds of alarm bells. No, it is. It, I, I know it's facile to say it, but it's so true. They're all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as Sir Johnny MacDonald said, we're all about peace, order, and good government. 
It goes way back. It goes way back. Matt, let's just, I'm going to ask you now to sort of um, marshal a set of arguments that Catherine could use. Uh, for example, the authority slash respect moral domain that we talked about earlier. How could she use that to her advantage to craft an ecological message that would find favor with conservatives? That one's a tricky one because you have to have the right authority uh, as the target of the authority that we're talking about. Uh, so you wouldn't want to say Al Gore or President Obama because that wrong authority, authority yeah, wouldn't be perceived as legitimate. Uh, likewise, probably uh, climate scientists are not the authority that people uh, would morally uh, listen to. Uh, rather, you're going to have to find the right authority, which is tricky, but I think uh, you mentioned Bob Inglis and others uh, may actually be that type of authority. Maybe business leaders, maybe politicians that uh, have a status in, in the eyes of uh, the religious right. Uh, maybe those are the individuals that you highlight when you're talking about uh, listening to authority figures. How about the Bible? Surely there are some passages in the Bible which suggest it's a good thing to keep the environment as green as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely more in Catherine's uh, domain, but I'm <laughs> sure uh, the thought process would be uh, that, you know, this is God's um, planet and, and it's his authority that we're trying to uh, uphold. And he said, you know, keep the, the planet uh, clean and, and prosperous. And, and therefore, we should follow what his authority suggests. Well, that's a good point. I should put this question to her. I mean, this is not exactly, we don't normally study the Bible on this program, but the now is as good a time as any. Catherine, can you point to one or two voices, uh, verses rather, in the Bible where uh, perhaps um, there is some admonition to keep the planet as green as possible? Well, you know, I really wish there was a verse saying, climate change is real and you better do something <laughs> about it. <laughs> but sadly, there is no such verse. But when you look at the Bible all the way from Genesis to Revelation, there's verses all the way through that talk about our attitudes and our perspectives, not just for this planet we live on, which the Bible would call creation, but also for other people. So in Genesis, it talks about how God created the planet and gave it to us humans to care for every living thing. So that's the concept of stewardship. And then throughout the New Testament, there's all kinds of verses about loving your neighbor, loving others, caring for the poor, taking care of those who can't care for themselves. And that's who climate change is impacting. And then when you get to Revelation, there's a verse in Revelation that talks about how God will destroy those who destroy the earth. So it's like, you know, the patience has run out at that point. So there are, there are definitely um, verses from the Bible that we can use to appeal to authority. And that's why I appreciate the research that Matthew does, because it shows how useful this type of approach can be. Let me follow up with this, though. You, I mean, we're glad that you're on this station tonight on our program. <laughs> Uh, you, you went on PBS as well, so let's just say, you know, you got the public television audience crowd, probably much of it on your side, mm -hmm. but you're up against big coal, which will spend probably by the end of the day hundreds of millions of dollars trying to debunk what you're saying and fight you to the death, and it yes. will be to the death in their case. Mm -hmm. How do you compete with that? I mean, to be honest, as one of my colleagues said, it feels like the Boy Scouts fighting the Marines sometimes. Or for history buffs, it feels like the Polish cavalry trying to fight the German tanks in World War II. I mean, here are we scientists. We're not trained in PR techniques. We're not trained in communication and messaging. We're just trained in physics and equations and computer programming. And we get tossed out as some of the most prominent and critical messengers on this topic. And so, man, it is a tough road to hoe. There is hate mail by the bucket. There are blog sites that are dedicated to making stuff up, saying I said it, and then lambasting me for it, kind of one side and then the other side. I mean, it's a tough life being a climate scientist these days, but we keep on going, not just me, but my colleagues too, because whatever our faith tradition or lack thereof, we believe it's the right thing to do. Hmm. Matt, in our last minute here, how long do you think it's going to take before conservatives see being green as not being inconsistent? Well, I think it's already started, uh, so hopefully sooner than later. Uh, but as I mentioned, that poll uh, even has uh, Republicans, uh, a small majority, but a majority of Republicans now wanting uh, climate believers in the, in the White House and to vote for them for uh, Congress. So I think that that's the beginning. And uh, it'll take a little time, but I think uh, we've seen a lot of progress in just the last few years, and I think we'll see more progress in the next five to 10 years. And hopefully by then, uh, it will have taken place. Well, there's a presidential campaign going on right now, in case yeah. you hadn't noticed. <laughs> uh, ample opportunity to have a debate about these issues. Thank you both so much for coming on the program tonight. Most fascinating. Catherine Hayhoe, the Associate Professor of Political Science, Director of the Climate Science Center, Texas Tech University. We thank you for being there on Skype from Lubbock, Texas. 
and Matthew Feinberg, the Assistant Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Rotman School of Management at U of T. Good to have you both, the, the American in Toronto, the Canadian in Texas. Good to have you both on our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.